fancy chocolate. I like the creamy middle. Been eating them this way since we were very little. We'll always be friends with O-R-E-O. -E yeah, do you remember that old Oreo commercial? Probably brings back some memories. Well, believe it or not, milk's favorite cookie had turned 100 last year. But just this week, researchers at Connecticut College said that the Oreo is just as addictive as cocaine, at least in lab rats. I want to point out that these pictures of these lab rats with those Oreos are pretty darn cute, but the researchers could have used any high-fat or high-sugar food. And obviously, a lot of people, they caught their attention. Now, Eric Stice is our go-to guy when it comes to food, our eating habits, and addiction. I spent some time with you, uh, Dr. Stice, in your lab, actually going through a scanner myself. What would you think of the study? Uh, well, I thought it was uh, provided very good evidence that the palatable foods, high fat, high sugar foods, activate brain reward circuitry in a very parallel way that uh, drugs of abuse do. That, it's, it's amazing. So, and I want to talk specifically about that. But first of all, these were rats. What about in humans? You, you've done research in that particular area. Yeah, no, and a lot of other people have actually administered food in the brain scanners, and it's clear that palatable foods activate our reward centers uh, exactly the same way that they're activated by drugs of abuse. And uh, the rats have, you know, there's a very parallel set of findings coming out of the rat literature um, that looks exactly like what we see with humans as well. People think of, when they think of drugs of abuse, uh, cocaine was the example they gave in the study, and people say that's, that's really addictive. Cocaine is very addictive. And now we're drawing this comparison between that and sugar, high fat, high sugar foods. Let me start by asking this, how do you define addiction? What does that mean uh, from, from your perspective? Uh, addiction really uh, is composed of two concepts. One is the idea of abuse, uh, that you have problems from use. So people who use cocaine uh, lose their jobs or become uh, you know, uh, rejected from their family because of the problems. That Those are negative consequences from use. The parallels with overeating would be that you develop medical problems from overeating. Uh, but there's also dependence, which is when you get your body physiologically used to having cocaine or palatable food on board, and then um, it creates a sense of tolerance, so you have to escalate how much cocaine you mm -hmm. use to get the same effect. And there's evidence that it, the same thing happens, that the more you eat Oreos, the more you're going to actually uh, escalate your intake of Oreos to experience the same degree of pleasure. Because you, I mean, so you start craving them more. If you eat some, you're going to start craving more and therefore eating more than ever. It's, it's just, it sounds very cyclical. Yeah, well, there, there's two changes that happen in our brains as we, you know, eat a whole bunch of palatable foods on a regular basis. One is that we get a blunted response of our reward circuitry, which is akin to tolerance with drug abuse. So escalating the amount of cocaine you have to do to get high you would similarly have to escalate the amount of Oreos that you eat to feel the same degree of pleasure. But the other aspect of it is a little bit more insidious, and that is you become hypervigilant to cues that have right. been associated with the reward from food or drugs, and then when you see those cues, you start craving the, the food or the drugs. And that, that's what really maintains the behavior. But this idea, again, of equating in some way sugar and cocaine, I mean, the brain only has one pleasure center, one sort of pleasure area, does it discriminate between different types of pleasure? Can we really put these on the same sort of ground, sugar and cocaine? So they're not exactly the same thing in slightly different areas of the reward circuitry is involved in each, but um, you know, th this does really extend some work by Sir Jamed out of France very nicely that found yeah. that rats would lever press uh, for sweet taste just as much as they lever press for cocaine, and the whole field was very incredulous about this when he initially published the findings, but these new data line right up with that. Yeah, I saw those studies where the rats would be pushing on the lever just as vigorously for the sugar as the cocaine. Now, let me ask you something. It's a little bit more philosophical almost, but people have heard about the numbers regarding the obesity epidemic. 35% of Americans are not just overweight, but obese. When, when we release these kinds of studies, I mean, is this saying addiction is in some way an excuse? I mean, do, are the people who are obese, is this, is this more because of this addiction? How much of this is willpower versus what's happening in the brain? Uh, well, there's two components to that. There's certainly our ability to operate executive control and make choices of pursuing goals like employment and a long-term relationship over drugs of abuse or overeating is very essential. But um, very new research is finding that there's individual differences in how quickly we learn to associate cues with reward from food or drugs. And the people who rapidly learn these cues for um, reward, they're the ones that get sucked into the habit much more than other people. So. 
there are genetic differences that, that have uh, an influence on this. So willpower, uh, putting it very concisely, some people don't have to um, bring much willpower to the table, whereas other people have to bring a great deal. Uh, Eric Stice, thank you. You shed some interesting in insights on that. Appreciate it.